everybody. Before we jump into today's episode, we have two sponsors we want to say thank you to for supporting this show. The first one is Routine. You guys have heard me talk about Routine, honestly, back from the early days of the podcast, and it's still a product I use every single morning. They have a prompt for me here. I'm going to do a little impromptu on this ad read today because, honestly, this is a product that I truly believe in, and so I'm going to, I'm just going to tell you guys exactly what I think and why. First and foremost, um, this is a stat that they shared, but when you sleep, you lose between a pound and a pound and a half of water. And most of that's just sweating while you sleep. Um, I used to not know if that was actually true, to be honest. I felt like a pound to a pound and a half of water seemed like quite a bit while I slept. But the one thing I did constantly pay attention to when I started using routine was just the fact that before using routine, I always felt a little dehydrated in the morning. And, and I'm one of those people that when I get up, I get up really early usually. I work out, one of, the, one of the first things I do is some form of fitness, it's just like what I do before everyone's awake. And so it's very easy for me to grab a coffee, you know, pre-workout, an energy drink, something with caffeine in it, and just go. When I am good about using routine first, I basically take, they come in these little single serve packets, um, they contain half an organic lemon, a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar, Himalayan sea salt, all six essential electrolytes, and they have no sugar in them at all. A lot of hydration products are going to have sugar. So one of the things routine, one of the things about routine that I love is that there's no sugar in there. Um, so when I am good about doing this consistently, I will take one of those single serve packets, I'll throw it in my mixer bottle. And whether I also put in a pre-workout or something with caffeine, or I just drink that separately, I try to drink that first. And the days I do that, I do genuinely feel hydrated and just have a different form of clarity all morning. A lot of people have tried to make their own homemade versions of routine, right? You see people making, they take an, a, a shot of the apple cider vinegar and they put a little sea salt, a little lemon in a drink. This is essentially that, but in a product that you can take with you on the go, have it ready for you first thing in the morning. I know me personally, when I'm groggy rolling out of bed, the last thing I want to do is, you know, squeeze a lemon, cut lemons up, go get the apple cider vinegar, find my sea salt. I just rip this packet open, throw it in my water, drink it, and it's good to go. You can try yours today. If you haven't tried it yet and you've been listening to this podcast for years, just try the damn routine. Give it a shot. You can use code ShaneWhite30 and get 30% off your first order. So you get 30% off by using code ShaneWhite30 and go to yourroutine.com. To make it even easier, I've added the link to yourroutine.com in the show notes. So just click on the show notes for this episode. Click on the link to yourroutine.com and don't forget to use code ShaneWhite30. All right, guys, today's episode is also bought to you by, bought to you, it's brought to you by NeuroRoast. Again, I'm going to go a little off script here. NeuroRoast is a product that I also came across during this year of 2023. They are a, a coffee brand, coffee company that's helping you optimize your brain function and overall well-being. This is another product that, to be honest with you, when I first started working with it, I was a little on the fence. I was like, do I really want to have mushrooms in my coffee? Well, folks, I will tell you when I use NeuroRoast, one of the things that has stood out to me the most is in, well, I'll back up. People that know me know that I have way too much caffeine, typically. One of the things this year I've done a good job of is cutting out alcohol. Not completely, but predominantly, I don't touch a lot of alcohol anymore. What I think I've actually done the other way, though, is add a lot more caffeine. So I do, I do definitely drink too much caffeine. That's something I need to work on next year is just trying to minimize how much of that, but NeuroRoast is something that has actually helped me. Because of the way they've formulated their coffee, like unlike regular coffee, which is you know still something I consume, but NeuroRoast specifically um, doesn't cause jitters or crashes. Mushroom coffee provides a more balanced and sustained energy, allowing you to stay focused and productive throughout the day. So the times I do use NeuroRoast, I'll be honest, I, I just don't feel that jittery, like Ugh, I'm jumping out of my chair or standing here at my desk, jumping around feeling. So give NeuroRoast a try. They have some really good flavors. I'll be honest too, the two guys that started NeuroRoast are just really good, really good dudes based out of New York and uh, they're hustling and, and hopefully they can, they can get some people to try NeuroRoast this holiday season um, by listening to this podcast. So for you folks who've been on the fence, I'm telling you, it tastes delicious. They've done a fantastic job of making this coffee not only be functional, but taste fantastic. And if you want to try NeuroRoast, you can use code Shane White. So it's super simple, just Shane White at checkout. Um, 
you'll also get 30% off. So if you go to neurorose.com, and once again, I have added that to the show notes. So just click into the show notes while you're listening to this episode, you can click on NeuroRoast link directly. Don't forget to use code just Shane White and you'll get 30% off your order. Um, hope you guys love both these products. I'm trying to not only bring you guys products that I use, but that I believe in on the podcast. Uh, I'm not taking ad reads for any brands that I don't really believe in. So anyway, hope you guys love both those products, yourroutine.com and neuroroast.com. I've added those links to the show notes. I uh, hope you guys love it. And I got an awesome guest coming up right after this. All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Shane White Show. I'm pumped today. Jordan Weitz is on the podcast. Jordan, welcome to the show. How are you? Appreciate it. I am doing well. Thanks for asking. Excited to be here. I he said I'm excited. I do feel like I say that a lot because I genuinely only talk to people on here that I'm pumped to talk to. The power of having your own podcast, I guess. But we met at Expo. And when we met at Expo a few months ago, when I got explained what you're doing and what you're building, just from being in the CPG industry, you know, not running a brand myself, but being so close to the front lines with a lot of brands. What you're building is awesome and something, you know, we've talked about off air, uh, something I, I'm passionate about and think there's so much potential in. So for everyone listening, Jordan, not to pump you up too much there, uh, would you mind giving everyone just a little bit of a rundown of, of what you're building at EJ? Yeah, 100%. And you, you want me to go into background too in case it Yeah, helps yeah if you don't mind. Yeah, give everyone yeah. A, little, a little intro to you. Just like 100%. Give me like a, little, a little flavor of who I am and what I do. Um, so yeah. by the way, I use that word flavor all the time during the day. Exactly. I need to stop like using that. it just because we're in the food world. I'm like, flavor, how can I come up with stupid puns that make people laugh? But uh, anyway, yeah, so my, my background, maybe even going back probably five years or so, probably more than that at this point, I guess eight or nine years ago, I was diagnosed with celiac disease going into my first year of college. And that is kind of when I realized how unimportant food and beverage products are to the world, but two, products I could and could not eat. So I became obsessed with the CPG realm. I was that kid walking in a grocery store, my headphones in, listening to a podcast about nutrition and ingredients, trying to figure out what types of products I could and could not eat. And I think that's what really kicked off my fatuation for consumer products and kind of health and wellness more broadly. So I always kind of knew that I wanted to spend some portion of my career kind of in this CPG realm. And ultimately, I Ended up at a consumer fund that was investing in high growth consumer brands like Olipop is a better for you soda brand that I'm sure everyone hears of now. Five organic kind of immunity shots, Hoya is a plant-based protein, protein drink, kind of you name it. Um, and then interestingly, what most people didn't know kind of about what we did, we moved down the supply chain to buy and invest in contract manufacturers as well. So kind of had this unique barbell approach. The fund was called Monogram Capital, great guys. And a very unique place to kind of continue learning about the ins and outs of kind of how brands are built, how things are produced, how products get on shelf. It's because I was hearing pain points on both the brand side as well as the manufacturing side. Brands, you would ask them what their biggest pain point was. It was always their operations, right? How do you produce more? How do we innovate faster? How do we get out in front of all these trends? Um, and then manufacturers, on the other hand, they have idle capacity. Their sales guys don't know exactly who to call. Brands don't necessarily know where to go to find the right manufacturer. You go to mm -hmm. Google, you go to brokers, you go to trade shows, all of kind of the legacy, archaic -y type ways of finding one another for arguably the most important piece of your entire business being your supply chain. So I thought it was crazy. Frankly, I was like, oh my God, this is insane. Like we talked to a beverage brand and they have no idea where to produce or they're looking for this capability and don't know where to go. So it started as a very small idea that I was going to create a, a website with some manufacturers on it that people could use just because I was doing my research at Monogram trying to better understand who was out there that can make sauces, right? In the same way that a brand doing marinara sauce was looking, I was out there trying to find the list of folks that we should go chase from like a acquisition or investment standpoint. Wow. Um, so anyways, long story short, bridge into kind of keychain, but, uh, you know, I actually sent a cold DM to one of my now co-founders, Oshin on Twitter, basically saying like, Hey, at the intersection of these, this kind of archaic industry, he was running a business called Angie's list at the time that I felt yeah, was a very yeah, yeah. interesting parallel to kind of building a marketplace in very different industry, obviously, but archaic in the same ways of 
take out your phone book, call down the Rolodex of folks that could come fix a light bulb in your house or clean your apartment, for example. Right. Um, a very similar problem set that I kind of figured and identified here in the CPG realm. So you know, we started meeting up more and more frequently. He got extremely excited about the idea. Umang, one of his co-founders from their prior business, got also extremely excited about the idea. And um, you know, we officially started Keychain back in um, August of 2023, so about a year ago now-ish, um, to build a platform at the intersection of brands, manufacturers, one in your supply chain and anyone on the brand or retail side to help them find the right supplier faster than they ever have before. So cool. And I'm sure you've gotten this a million times, but this is the classic, if you're in CPG and then you hear that whole intro, you're like, how the fuck did I not come up with that? You know what I mean? Like it's, it's such a, cause it's every, what you're to your point, every single brand person in this space deals with that. And I vividly remember at our X bar, even when we were expanding into other categories outside of bars, I remember sitting in one meeting with some of our supply chain folks and I'm going to butcher this, but it was a similar process to what you're saying. I was like, how do we even find a manufacturer for that product? And they kind of said the same thing. They're like, you kind of, we kind of like go to Google, we ask around, we, I was like, wow. Okay. So it's, it's literally just you searching like anyone else could search. There's not like a centralized place that everyone goes to, to meet up. It's pretty wild. crazy. I mean, even the most sophisticated of brands, like the very exploratory phase in, in their early days. I mean, obviously it's a, it's a no brainer for someone like Shane's cookies company that wants to start your own gluten-free shop and you have no idea where to go, but it's also a totally different story for a company like Coca-Cola or even Hershey's or Mondelez, right. where yeah. you would expect that a lot of these companies, the Rolodex, they know everyone that can make everything at any moment in time. They don't, right? So yeah, yeah. it's just everyone uses the same process. And, you know, I always like to use this one anecdotal example, but one of our largest retail customers right now found us by Googling ice cream cake manufacturer on Google. He's a retailer. You would think that he would know everyone that can make something he's looking to make. I mean, it's a top three retailer in, in the country. And, you know, it was just crazy to me that someone like that was searching for, obviously, ice cream cake's a little bit kind of unique rather than it just being cookies. But, um, you know, your first instinct was to go to Google to find websites that could help you identify versus it being kind of more traditional marketplace that could help you actually identify who you needed to work with. That makes a ton of sense. I, when you and I chatted last time too, you know, before we had the podcast, I remember vividly thinking to myself, for a lot of people listening, it probably comes off pretty obvious that the, the need today, your exact point, if I wanted to start, you know, product XYZ, having something like this to go find out who could make it is a huge need. But then when we dove deeper into it, the one side I hadn't thought about, which, you know, obviously you guys are solving as well is, you know, these manufacturers, they're good at manufacturing. They're not necessarily great at inbound and, and just, you know, imagining, I'm always going to go back to the protein bar conversation. It's like, if you're making protein bars, like how many people are probably reaching out to you with their ideas and they can only run some minimal amount, like that process has to be so convoluted and broken for the manufacturers too, that you're, it's crazy that you found a problem that is actually like two sided. Like the issue is both ways. It's not just, the cons it's not just the people trying to create products. It's actually the other side, probably just as much, if not more. It's a huge vetting issue in terms of knowing who can actually make what. And I, I think it always comes down to like the processing capability level. It's not just that someone wants to make a granola bar, but it's, I want to make a granola bar, maybe like RX bar that would be likely made on a single screw extrusion machine, right? Oh, maybe like or, specifics like that. Right. So, or like a granola bar, like a, I don't know, like... Uber Easy is one of my favorite granola bar brands. It's like a, you know, whatever, but it's like made through like slab technology, right? Oh, so okay. what's yeah. interesting is I think a lot of people think that the manufacturing industry is kind of like, hey, I want to make a soda or I want to make a granola bar. But I think what we've identified is getting down to the granular level, level of saying, hey, you know what? I want to make something that is co-extruded. I want it to be guillotine cut. I want it to be flow wrapped and I want it to be put into a cardboard box. It's a lot different than just saying, hey, I want to make a granola bar. So, you know, our North yeah. Star is being able to kind of place brands, retailers, food service operators and projects down to a capability level so that it's not just saying, hey, someone's looking to make a granola bar, but hey, these guys are the exact right fit for the capabilities and technology that you need to make that same granola bar, if that makes sense.
that that's a great example and i'd never thought of it down to that degree because i've never done that so that that's crazy yeah like the, the amount of specific things that and i was i would assume if you're just a founder and you're building an excel spreadsheet of people you're reaching out to like the process of just going through figuring out okay can you do all five of these things let that's alone crazy. understanding if you're even hitting the moqs like there's there's like 10 checkpoints that you're probably going to find out you just wasted time on it's funny. I mean, if you go to any manufacturer's website and, you know, I would say, I don't want to kind of say everyone's website is not great and, and not detailed, but I would confidently say 85 to 90% of the websites that I've at least been to probably haven't been updated in 20 years. Don't necessarily reflect everything that you can do today. Right. Which is a whole another crazy thing to me. Um, but then also, you know, typically you have to get on the phone with them to actually understand exactly what they do which is a waste of time for them as well as for you. Because you're having a lot of these introductory conversations without knowing exactly if someone can do what you're looking to do. And you know that's where we kind of want to position ourselves, where if you are a manufacturer that comes on board to Keychain, you don't need to have those upfront calls anymore, right? We know what you can yeah. do and we know what the brands are looking for. You can know technically if you will be able to do it. All you have to do is decide if you want to work with that person and if it makes economic sense for you as well. That, yeah, that's, that's wild. I'm just thinking of so many ideas and so many, so many situations where this can help. I mean, it's funny. I would have to agree with you. You know, the websites I've always looked at and glanced at, and even when I was doing research before this, it's so true that, you know, that's not what they're good at. I mean, I can even say on my own website for what we do. It's, as you're saying that, I'm thinking to myself, like, yeah, we probably, we're so busy operating the business that I don't, sometimes when we make pivots, I don't think to necessarily go to my website and tweak it right away. That's a really good point. So that, I think that's a great way to like lay the foundation for what Keychain is. Jordan, I th the beginning story, the zero to one is the, my, one of my favorite parts of this podcast and having you on here. So, you know, I see you're doing the research, you're, you're making, you know, spreadsheets, doing your research when you're working at the other firm. And then you reach out on Twitter. I, I think that's a, that's a piece I don't want to skip over too, fa too far. I think sometimes people, they downplay, especially today with all the different platforms, how connected we all still are. And like, if you really want to take a shot, you can take a shot. Would you mind giving the listeners today just a little bit more of a rundown? You know, how did you even think to go about that to not only DM him on Twitter, but I guess like how you thought of what you were going to say? Because there's all these concepts obviously around, do you, did you send him something where you offered him help? Did you ask him? Like, it seems like I'm assuming you probably didn't reach out and say, hey, you should be my co-founder of this crazy idea I have. You know, that's probably not what you said, I'm assuming. But I think for people listening, this, that's a huge nugget today is just what a leap you took in general to reach out to someone you didn't know who's done something in the space that you're interested in and just took your shot. Because I think a lot of people just wait and don't take that shot. I mean, I have always been pretty shameless when, a term, when it comes to reaching out to people. Um, I never really think twice about sending a message to someone, even if they're the Mark Cubans of the world. And, okay. you know send them something pretty custom and, and personalized. But I would say that is probably, I don't want to, I don't want to say it's a superpower because anyone could do it. It just means it's a mentality that you have to get in that if you don't, you don't get a response from someone, you have to forget about it and move on with your life. But I have always sent cold emails to people. And I think that's a major reason for why I'm here where I am today, obviously from a keychain angle, but Eva Dickinson, who I know, you know, you know, well, yeah, yeah, actually, and this is going back a, a handful of years now, but my senior year of college, I was listening to a podcast he was on, sent him a note after I heard what he was saying on the podcast. He started talking and then I ended up interning for him like during the summer, right? So wow, okay. All, cool. all, I, like, I keep getting these like little, you know, positive reinforcements that when you do send an email to someone, like sometimes they do respond and it can lead to great things. And for all the times that someone doesn't respond, that one time that someone does respond makes up for everything that you've done there thereafter. So but that's like a huge staple to kind of who I am as a person today. I take pride in kind of the notes that I send to try to get people to to respond. So okay, I love that. I um went to the Twitter DM. Oh, it's funny because in the moment when I like think about it, uh, I went back to it more recently just because I hadn't in a while. I was gonna say you, you almost need to print it out and frame it. I know, in the office. I know. That's it's, that's that's it's like so a... cringy, man. It's actually pretty cringy. Like go, like I had this like picture in my mind that it was like this amazing message that was like you know, kind of dangling the idea and like whatever, it kind of baity, but it, it was it was kind of wild. I mean, I, it was a little bit cringy. So I probably would say if I were doing it again, I would probably tweak it a little bit, but. That's also oh, hindsight's 2020. 100%. I, I think 
am very casual when I send messages to people. I think my general tone when emailing and texting generally is I try to make it seem as if you're talking to me live, which comes across some ways as being like extremely informal and unprofessional sometimes, but I think it gets people to respond. Um, yeah, so I like that. it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't necessarily need to be hi, XYZ. Great to meet you. My name is Jordan and this is my, like, no one cares. I mean, some people care. Also like, that that's true. Like I I've never thought about, it, but I kind of put my guard up when I get this formal email. Cause you feel like you need to like focus and then like formally respond versus what you're talking about, which yeah, you just fire something back. There's probably a happy medium between what I do and kind of what other people do. Are you <laughs> Jordan's, Jordan's, like, <laughs> like, Jordan's the class. Are you the classic? Like you send the message as the title of an email. No body. Oh, oh my God. No, <laughs> I'm efficient, but I'm not that efficient, Shane. Um, but but, but anyway, yeah, I mean, sending cold messages has always been a key part of who I am kind of as a business person generally. And okay. I think a casual tone goes a really long way. Uh, Gene, you know, we were, I sent him a kind of a dangly-ish message saying, hey, I'm in this unique spot sitting at the intersection of another industry that, you know, I believe has similar characteristics to what business you have run for the last, call it 10 years of your life. And naturally he asked, what, what is that industry? And I gave a quick flavor, again, to use the word, um, of kind of what the CPG landscape was. Again, not going into too many details, but enough for him to say, let's get coffee on Monday. This was, like, I think, a Friday, um, and we started meeting up immediately. So wow. um, he's a great guy. I mean, I, I think when, when it comes to entrepreneurs and creative thinkers, especially if you've already solved a problem in one space and being able to kind of think creatively around how I can solve that problem again in a different space, it's kind of unique. My my goal of the conversation, Shane, to your point, I didn't say, hey, we should do this. Like, I honestly just wanted a better reason to not ever think about this idea ever again. I could okay. sleep at night. <laughs> or if like, a, hey, like, this is dumb. Like, is this is this a dumb idea? Uh, and I say it ended up not being, which is, which is good because he was excited about it too. But that was the initial framing of like, hey, I'm, I'm waking up in the middle of the night. I think this is a cool idea. You help me sleep. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Okay. No, I love that. No, it's a good, it's a good point. Instead of uh, just trying to like hype yourself up and be in an echo chamber type of thing where you're just getting all this positive, you know, gotta be vulnerable and make, yeah. make someone feel as if they can help you out as well as this was obviously potentially beneficial for them too. Okay. Yeah, no, I love that. And so I always say this part of the story too is, is interesting. You know, you taking the leap, sending the message, huge step, no matter what. I mean, ultimately that's some of the steps that people just never take. They might, they'll talk about all day, their ideas, but taking the, I always consider the first step, the most important. It's like getting the ball rolling. However, you also, you know, you went to, you went to a prestigious school. Now you're working at a big firm. I'm sure you, you know, in all sense, senses of like your career and to your family and everything, you're like, you're doing well. Like this is your, like Jordan's doing great to then take the leap to start something like this. Walk us through that part, because that's a huge, huge component that I think, again, there's all these people that maybe then start talking to people and create a cool business plan. And they're talking about all these things, but quitting your great paying job or your career path to go start something over here. That's where most people don't take the leap. So what was that like for you? And would love to just hear the considerations and thought process you had as you were making that decision. Yeah. I mean, I think it probably plays back to my childhood, frankly, and kind of like who I am as a person. So we were always at the dinner table talking about problems we had and ways that we can solve them. Very entrepreneurial father figure. And, you know, he started his own business and was always kind of coming up with ideas. We watched Shark Tank all the time, not to be cliche, right? And cool. we, we were yeah. always like talking about different things. So I, I always had the entrepreneurial bug. I guess two quick examples from like things that I've done historically, just in case, I mean, a lot of people actually don't know this, but I am um, freshman year of high school started a started it's not a company but like a sneaker reselling business i saw this on your linkedin i wanted to ask yeah you. and that was really fun i was absolutely obsessed with like air jordans and kind of like drops and kind of limited number of of pairs of shoes and was able to get my hands on a on a bunch of them and then i essentially started with about 800 dollars that i got from winning a march madness bracket pool which was awesome wow. like, i was like freaking out i was like holy crap like $20, getting back 800 like this is insane. I forget what year it was, but I, I guess it was probably like circa 2011 or something like that. Um, anyway, I decided that I wanted to invest that $800 into kind of the my shoe reselling business. Okay. Um, and 
was just obsessed. I mean, this was my first foray into kind of like talking to people I'd never had met, even met before over like Facebook Messenger, negotiating yeah, yeah, yeah. with them, like telling them why they should pay what price, creating a business, you know, understanding that I bought shoes for one price and then having to sell them for another in order to make profit. Like obviously the very basics, but it kind of gave me that bug of like, okay, this is my company. This is what I do. Like I'm creating profit for myself. And I like that. So that was kind of the first thing. Second thing in college, I started a company with a few of my friends called Barista, which was, um, again, a lot of people don't know this. I don't even think I have it on my LinkedIn, but we went through a kind of like an accelerator program at Yale. Um, and the thought there was that we're going to kind of create a coffee subscription service for locally owned coffee chains in the New Haven, Connecticut area. So what's funny is like Panera and all these groups kind of like came up with like coffee subscriptions, like shortly thereafter, and not to say that they weren't probably thinking about it at the same time that, that we were doing it, but our idea was how can we get students to have to pay less for kind of the coffee that they were consuming from these like locally owned places. So classic cool. subscription model of like. You know, you pay us 30 bucks a month, you get 30 coffees and the discount you would have had on however many coffees you would have bought would have been great enough and whatever. So we, we built a little bit of technology, kind of like a text messaging service, where if you were in the coffee store, you could send a text message with the coffee store's name. We would then send you back an automatic kind of like receipt that you would show the barista. And then you would walk out the door with your coffee without like paying anything like actually there. We were like running around, like delivering checks to the baristas, like every day, because we had three coffees redeemed at one store and two coffees redeemed at another store. But yeah, you know, it wasn't big money at all. Like we had a small like grant that we got from the school just because we won this like accelerator thing. But, and like, this was me and my friends sitting in a room with like a whiteboard trying to figure out like, okay, coffee's expensive. We don't have money to pay for it. Like, how can we come up with a creative way to get more students in these locally owned coffee stores and at a discount? So that's a great kind of, idea though. I mean, it's not, it's on, funny. It's, it's funny. I mean, like, I love we, doing that. There's a game where you can like, just throw out your, like your, your funniest, goofiest ideas. That's like a good one. I actually would argue that's it a was decent fun. idea. I mean, like we, I mean, it was very classic, like again, whiteboarding session that turned into something and yeah. look, we, we didn't have a ton of people using it and it was like more of a side hustle project, but it Fine. reminds me though of even, I mean, this is a dumb analogy, but it kind of reminds me of how, you know, Facebook started, right? Like even at, just at Stanford, it was kind of, it became popular obviously, but like, I don't know, that's an interesting concept. I still think you could like copy paste that if you had the right technology across the country. Agreed. You know? I mean, it's locally, we wanted to support local cafes. And I think one of the interesting things that we saw was that we as students had access to kind of like the calendar of when big lectures were getting out and like where those lectures were located. So we were like there's a local coffee store outside of XYZ lecture hall, being able to like push a notification on our end to all the students that were signed up to us saying that XYZ coffee shop is doing this type of program. Like there's a lot of things that we were trying to like leverage the being Yale students and having access to students calendars to be able to push that traffic to locally owned coffee stores. But sure. Anyways, I know that was kind of a tangent, but I think no, feeds no, into I mean, this like entrepreneurial yeah. idea that I've always grown up with. So the leak generally was, I mean, it was tricky. I mean, like Monogram, like is the, like truly some of the best people I've ever met and then worked with and the fund is doing great and they're awesome. Right. So I always had known that I wanted to do something entrepreneurial and felt very, it felt like the right time, especially since I had Oshin and Umang to do it with. Sure. I mean, they've raised a lot of venture money before they built a successful business, sold it to a publicly traded company, ran a publicly traded company, and now wanted to do it all over again. I was like, oh my God. With you. With you. This is a no brainer. Exactly. Right. Got it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, this is crazy. Kind of a unique opportunity that, you know, I've always wanted to do my own thing. And this is a great way to kind of learn from some of the best and get my hands dirty doing this whole entrepreneurial thing. I also say to anyone who, who's, you know, you know, contemplating that for you, to me, that feels like you kind of had a, you had a softball like that. That's kind of like, God's like, okay, Jordan, this, the stars are aligning here kind of situation. The funny thing is, obviously, if you had a good relationship and you were doing well at Monogram, the other thing I always like to tell people is if you give it a shot and it doesn't work, you probably can go back to doing what you're doing. So there's not like a, as much risk as I think people genuinely think there is. And I would argue too, I mean, in the entrepreneurial space, you don't see a lot of people end up going back, even if it doesn't work, because they just they they realize they're so hungry for solving problems and getting things done, they'll just jump to the next thing. So, 
it's that addicting. It I mean, it, it really is. Addicting. I mean, like, yeah, in a way that I was not expecting it to be. And I mean, look, it's it's a lot harder later nights, hard working, and it's hard to really unplug. I think that's kind of the, my biggest thing is that I'm constantly yeah. thinking about like tomorrow is even on like a Friday night or Saturday morning, right? Like mm -hmm. you're just you're responsible for a lot of people's lives, just having people employed at Keychain. You're also responsible for, you know, making investors happy. You're also responsible for keeping yourself sane. Like there's all these things that you just have like you know, growing responsibilities that I think makes this even harder. But the awesome is that like the wins are unlike anything else. The losses are also unlike anything else, but it's that yeah. like same type of thing that you have one small win, you're kicked back into motion and it's a dick. It truly is. That's such a good way to put it. I, and I haven't heard someone put it that that concisely. It was funny. I, I know uh, my mother-in-law recently, I, she was on the phone with my wife and she, she was like, how's your week going? And it was Tuesday, I think. So this was last week. And I was like, I mean, I've had like three highs and four super crazy lows. So to any normal human, it would be like, just the, the most chaotic start to your week you have ever had but it's like a normal tuesday for me so funny so, I, I do the you know. same exact thing because like i spend a lot of my day doing like do a lot of our sales type of stuff at keychain so okay. i'm driving a lot of the the revenue through the gate and or our team is and you now it will be on a call with a manufacturer who is like a very old school kind of legacy type of guy who's probably a lot older than any of us here right now and I'll be on like a call at you know 11 a.m. on a Monday being like, hey, how's your week going so far? And he's like, what do you mean? Like, I just woke up. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have I, been working I totally for you. Um, eight days in a row. Yeah, exactly. It's funny. It, it's a totally different thing. And the other thing I know that's hard, uh, are you guys in, you guys have an office, like a physical office at Keychain? Yeah, I can uh, I can share some more about that too in, in case it's Yeah, helpful, I would love but... to because it's interesting, right? Like I know you know a little bit about what I do, you know, being remote and I work from home. So there's some in-person things for sure, but a lot of it's from home. And so the thing you said about unplugging, I think for any entrepreneur, it's just so hard. Like when I, back when I worked for, you know, during COVID, when I worked for a YouTube role, you just shut your laptop and usually don't look at it again until you open it the next day. Like it's kind of easier to do that. But when it's your own, you're just, you know, I've even tried to do better about like batching notifications. And it's like, there's little things that seem to work here and there. But at the end of the day, it's your baby. So you're, you, it's like anything else, right? If your real baby's crying, you're going to run and take care of it no matter what time of day it is. So it's, it's hard to explain to people who haven't been in the, in the trenches of that. It's, there's things that come up that other people would not condemn that being an emergency that I think sometimes as a founder, you just, it's your baby. So you just want it to be taken care of all the time. I also have like a philosophy that if there's something that needs to get done and I think about it, like I just do it right then. Like I don't. And it's honestly a blessing and a curse because I probably spend my time on like very small things that I'm just doing to like get done because I thought about it. Yeah, um, yeah. But anyway, on the on the point about the office, so yeah, we have we have our HQ is in New York. Okay. We're kind of in. We're actually in one of the World Trade Center buildings downtown. Wow, cool. Yeah, and so our headquarters are here. We have a twenty ish. I'm just trying to think outside. Yeah, about probably twenty ish people here. We now have a new office that we actually just opened in Austin, Texas as well. Nice. It's exciting. Cool. Yeah. Congrats. We have four folks out of there. And then we have another location in India, which is where most of our software engineering team is. So we have a dedicated wow. office space there as well. One of my co-founders, Umang, he's, he's from India and goes back, I don't know, four or five, six times a year. So we decided to stand up our engineering unit over there just to make things a little bit more for him as well when he's traveling to wow to to. okay i had no idea that you guys were this expanded congratulations yeah, we this we probably like have around 40 ish people at, at keychain now wow congratulations wild. jordan yeah. that's exciting in a year too that's that's some explosive growth yeah we have we had our six month product birthday on a birthday i guess it's a half birthday at, at oh, yeah i think point. i saw that but, on uh, LinkedIn. Yeah. Last, last week which was awesome but yeah it's been since we since we raised, it's been around a year ish or so now. So team has grown quite quickly, yeah. very fast. But I think, look, I mean, in order to do what we're doing, doing there, it takes a lot of research and a lot of engineering to build an amazing product. And um, we've tried to over invest in best people that we can to kind of build the best product we can as fast as humanly possible. I love that. Yeah, it makes sense. And I, so now we're getting into some of the nitty gritty. I'm, I'm excited to hear a little more of this too. So you know, jumping to this going full throttle after it. The, the one thing that is very evident from talking to you today is 
it's a mentality and I'm sure this is helpful with the co-founders you picked is it sounds like it's like pedal down full throttle speed ahead versus something like slow and steady and take your time. This is like a speed thing. What would have been, what have, what were at the beginning, I guess, like you jump, what were some of the, like the tangible things happening in those first few months? Like I always like to ask this for founders, like, did you not get paid for a little bit Were you guys, or were you guys able to like raise capital immediately? And so you guys got to at least pay yourself a little bit to get started. How did all that work? Cause like starting a software company to me feels like number one, I have no clue how much that costs. I'm sure it's a lot more than I imagine. And then two, just starting a business like this with some successful people, I'm sure there's just different dynamics. Like, you know, you're a guy who I can tell, you know, obviously you're younger in your career, so they're probably having some sort of salary is helpful. Uh, and then you work with people who've had some success. So just different dynamics, I'm sure, also make it a little bit, you know, getting out the gate. I'm sure there were a lot of conversations you guys all had to align on, but we'd just love to know just, you know, even the first few months, how you kind of navigated that and, and like tangibly made it work to be on your own yeah. with Because I think it's a tough, like most people, like I said, there's all these gates that I've mentioned today. A big one that I've heard so many times is like, I don't know if I can pay for insurance. And I always tell people, I'm like, well, I mean, it's expensive. Don't get me wrong. It's not, it's not, it's not a cheap thing, but it's not the biggest problem usually for, for someone to jump ship and, and make it work. So we'd love to hear your experience. Yeah, no, it's, it's the right question. And on that piece, we, and very luckily were able to raise as much money as we were out of the gates, which helped a lot. We, we raised around 18 million in pre-seed funding uh, wow, to kind of take a big so swing. Much. Yeah. To take a big swing. Congrats. at this. So we, yeah, no, it's, it's been great. So um, a lot of that Oshina and Umang, I mean, there was a great story, right? I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I come from the CPG background, so I have like the, the real tangible experience. They've built a hell of a marketplace in a very different industry. But again, where, where I always kind of brand what Keychain is, it's kind of a quasi Angie's list, but for the CPG manufacturing world, which I think just makes sense to a lot of people and then investors at that time as well. But the beginning days of kind of what we built at the end of the day, like a lot of our asset is our data. Mm. So when we were initially thinking about like, what are we going to do to start Keychain? The first thing that we were trying to build was a robust data set. So the product was built, was launched in February, and we probably kicked off the data gathering exercise in call it late August, early September. Okay. So okay. the data structure and kind of how we were going to collect the data, how we were going to figure out what manufacturers exist out there types of products that all of them can make, where they're located, all that information of kind of taking much data that's available on, online around who exists, what things they can do, doing research ourselves independently and all this type of stuff to try to create a base data function to then build a product on top of. So the first few months, I mean, we're really heads down doing that and a lot of Google Sheet and a lot of Google Doc. I bet, <laughs> um, yeah. Which was, which is cool. I mean, like, I think what I've realized is that you could have the best strategy ever laid out on a Google doc, but until you actually start doing things, it doesn't even make any sense to go past like the first couple of weeks. Right. So okay. I remember okay. in the early days, we built like super robust document of like all these things that we were going to plan to do, which was great from like having a conversation perspective. But, you know, if you go back in reality, kind of what transpired, like we did the first thing and then we're like, oh shit, like maybe we should do this and then moved on to something else. Right. So, um, you know, tangibly kind of what we were doing, I was spending a lot of my time trying to figure out like, how are we going to create the world's largest and most detailed database of manufacturers in the country? That was our number one goal. And then once we felt good about that, we would build a product on top of it, which we started to do kind of in on November, December-ish, so worked on that for a few months before launching it. I think what was interesting about like that journey over that like December, January, February timeframe, I'm a perfectionist at heart. Okay. Realized doing this entrepreneurial thing and, and the startup thing, you really can't be. And I was always pushing back like, hey, like, you know, maybe it's not ready. Like someone's going to log in and they're going to have an error. And like, you know, I just wanted it to be perfect whenever someone logged in, but you can't do that, right? Oshin's philosophy, I think specifically, is that get to get it to a place where you feel comfortable talking about it and allow people to kind of jump in, play around with it, and then give you feedback so that you can learn how to iterate faster than you, you would have before. I think that's honestly a major reason for how we are where we are today, even six months in. The product's pretty good. I and mean, I think a lot of that was informed from people even in like the early February days that were actually playing around with it in its first test case. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's no different than any product, any service, any, anything. You can like sit in your office and 
chit chat about it and throw ideas at the wall until you get it out there and get feedback. It's so true, man. It's, it's, uh, it's such an easier thing said than done, I think, but it's the truest of things like the minimal viable product concept. It's, it's the hardest. And I, I agree with you. Like some of the things we've done, I feel the same way where you're, I'm the perfectionist for sure. And our, on our team, and uh, I've had to learn to let go a little bit and be like, okay, let's just, it's not my perfect, but maybe to someone else, it'll, it'll help us get feedback. Then you just, it gets better faster also than in just letting it be within the team and thinking the team can figure out every problem, like get it out there to the masses. So that's interesting too. I didn't realize how early in the product journey you were when we even met at Expo. I mean, you were like, I mean, this was like fresh out the gate. Basically, so had like just launched. It was like we were in beta and I guess technically still in beta, but um, yeah, I mean, it was probably a few weeks into kind of like having our first people using the platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, we, that was kind of when we launched it to the public. We had people for like a couple months before then kind of using it kind of as an alpha customer, as you will, as we were trying to build out the feature set. But yeah, February 13th, I will always remember that day. Always remember that. That's so cool, man. And so it's up and it's, it, you know, when you launched the beta, what was it like for you? I mean, was that like a big relief after all these months of, of hard work or has it also been like making you hungrier? The answer could probably be both, but. Yeah, I'd love to know, like, right after that, once it's live, like, how, where did where did Jordan's head go once it's out in the public and and you're starting to get customers on both sides of the fence? I'm sure. I mean, it's just hearing people, even anecdotally to this date, like people text me to your point, Shane. I mean, like random people that I sometimes have never even heard about before have heard about what Keychain is, right? And it's just pretty surreal that, like, you know, a year ago we were in a room kind of thinking about like what this could become. And now we have folks like you know, some of the largest retailers and brands in the world using it to find the manufacturer. I mean, it's, it's been pretty cool. So I think like in that moment, stressed, <laughs> I was like, I was like, I would see someone from like a brand that I recognize and even a person that I knew, which, you know, our earliest customers were sometimes people that I would say, Hey, keychain.com just launched. Let me know what you think. And like, yeah. you know, being very anxious when they started typing back to me, I was like, oh my God, what are they going to say? Like, God damn, like they're typing something long. This is not- <laughs> You're like, what is it going to be? Right? It's going to be roasted here. Well, I think like one of my like biggest learnings to this is being able to kind of like take constructive feedback and not use that as a way to kind of get disappointed of, around what you've built, but rather how can we make this a hundred times better for all of our users? Because I think we're, we're lucky to be in a space where most of our users already understand the value proposition and we're still tr we're trying to figure out a way to just make it even better and easier for them but yeah i mean it was it was pretty surreal i mean even at expo west people had heard of keychain wow and it was it was cool yeah yeah no it's 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 awesome i i do think it's funny and i could be totally wrong you're obviously way closer to this than me if i if someone like flat out asked me i would say you know the one thing that's difficult with cpg and it'll it'll be around forever, obviously. I mean, it's, there's you know, it's not like a thing that's going to go away. Innovation, right? I feel like it's getting harder and harder. I mean, there's just been in the last ten years, there's been so many things in every category that are trying to innovate. But it does feel like there's still so much like rudimentary software solutions that like SaaS in tech has been solving for a couple of decades now. I think I don't know. I think CPG is actually kind of a hotbed for a lot of potential things. I know in my world, what's interesting too is it seems like for and what you've alluded to already is there's so much organic word of mouth because of how, how big of a problem Keychain is solving versus there are other things that even softwares that I use today. And I've always, I always try to think like, how did I find that software? And it's tough. Like in a lot of, a lot of categories, they're just overwhelmed with advertising. Like as far as, you know, if I need a tool for Amazon, geez, like good luck, go Google it. And there's like 500 versions of it that anyone and everyone's tried to create. But for you, it seems like, you know, not only was this something that didn't exist, which is huge, but also it just makes so much sense. So do you guys do, do you have to do a lot of offense or is a lot of it word of mouth inbound on both sides at this point? Yeah. Brands and retailers know, you know, we, we do do some offense on the mm -hmm. kind of demand generation side. I think a lot of, if you type into Google right now, popcorn manufacturer or is there any food product and then manufacturer, Keychain's probably showing up somewhere on kind of the first few results. Oh, so okay. I would say right. like we definitely are you know, driving traffic to the website, but I think, I mean, you know this better than I do at, at this point, but this industry, CPG generally, the people are amazing humans. They're good at recommending kind of great platforms and everyone's trying to solve kind of a very similar problem set. So 
you know, we found a lot of people just simply referring us to their friends, which is kind of the best form of marketing. Um, you know, it, it is a free platform for brands and retailers. So there really isn't like a gotcha moment at all. Right. A lot of our brands and retailers don't, um, they are shocked that we're giving it to them for free, kind of this basic version of it. Okay. And it does help us kind of create that demand and buy a wheel, at least on the brand and, and retail referral side. Uh, so that's one piece on the manufacturing side a lot of manufacturers haven't heard of us. Right. So okay. they're like, yeah. what do you mean you have a profile for us on, on keychain? It's, it's kind of a similar model to the way glass doors is built. I don't know how familiar you are with that. Oh, kind of. Yeah. We have a profile for every manufacturer that exists in the country, whether we've spoken to them or not, because we want to make sure really? that we're exhaustive. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, how did you guys, how was that? Like, I mean, was that just an immense amount of research to just scrape? Holy cow. Lots of research. That was like what I was talking from that August to Every October. single. And then I, how, do you, how do you know when a new one like comes on? If like, I'm like, ah, I'm starting my muffin bakery tomorrow or yeah. manufacture or whatever. It's an ongoing process. I mean, like we, and when I say all, I probably mean 95% coverage because who knows exactly if we're missing anyone, but sure, you know, yeah. I've been testing it for the last six months or so. Every almost every other day, probably I send a message to someone on our team saying, Hey, do we have this manufacturer? Or I look it up and send feedback. And like, I haven't, there hasn't been one in a while that we didn't have, which is pretty awesome. Um, oh. So yeah, that, that's kind of how that part works. But a lot of manufacturers like have been so used to very old school ways of doing business, right? I mean, they have salespeople that literally dial jits to get on the phone with customers that aren't using a phone anymore, right? Like it's, yeah. it's pretty yeah. archaic and yeah, manufacturers work when they, when we set up a call with them, it's too, typically their first time ever hearing of keychain, which again, hopefully should change as we continue to onboard more and more folks. But yeah, most manufacturers aren't using technology today. So it is kind of like a lift to say, hey, this is why you should use us. And this is why we exist. I love that. I don't want to make, make sure we don't skip over that. I think for a lot of people listening today, there's probably a lot more of the retailers and brand type folks that are listening to this. So that's a huge piece. I remember the first time you told me it was like a light bulb in my head. So it's free for those folks. And then if you're a manufacturer, you pay a fee. And I'm, the one question that I, I wanted to ask you actually was, this is just not knowing anything about developing software. And I'm actually over the years have become very fascinated and I think it's a really interesting world. What I'm sure the very beginning, how do you, I mean, it's, it would seem like it would be a lot easier to get retailers and brands because it's free. So it's like you could get all these users in, but obviously you have to have manufacturers. You at least need a couple, I would assume that are paying, like, how do you get both sides of that equation? I think it's one like software related question. I've never fully understood how, how software companies do that where you need both sides for it to work, but you got, you need one to pay first. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think like most marketplaces, you need the demand on the platform in order to get the supply really excited and interesting, interested. So okay. because we've been successful getting brands and retailers of all different types of sizes and some decent, like decently big names that you'll, you'd probably go to their store potentially this afternoon using Keychain, it's very nice and easy for us to dangle, hey, by the way, X is using our platform today. If you are not using our platform, they may work with someone that you don't want them to, right? Or they uh, may be sure. work with one of your competitors. So yeah. you know, we have a lot of demand on the platform. We have a lot of projects every single week that come in saying, hey, I am XYZ retailer with 1800 doors. I'm looking to make a you know, greens product. I need you to help me find a manufacturer. We show them the, you know, you know, they would use our platform to see the right list. If you are not part of our ecosystem, you will not see that that project came in. So I think... A lot of these facilities we talk to have excess capacity, have line time that they're they're wanting to utilize, but get the feeling of kind of this fear of missing out that if you're not part of the ecosystem, you're just going to be missing those projects. And for Once, them, the fee, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. The fee, the fee makes sense because it's a sales funnel. And so exactly. they'll get it's, business. It's so much sense. Exa exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a tangible ROI on kind of the business that you drive through Keychain. And um, it's typically cheaper than going to a trade show, hiring another, you know, couple people to do kind of everything that we do already through technology. I'm not going to say it's easy, right? I mean, the people that we speak to are oftentimes, you know, 50 to 70 year old people that have run the business sure. for, it's been in their family for hundreds of years and they haven't kind of changed the way they've done business historically. But I think it's been, you know, refreshing to hear the excitement by a lot of these 
second generation people in the family that are excited about leveraging technology to use, drive more business into their facility. So oh, spending money on something to, to drive sales is, is kind of a no brainer for them. If it were. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes a ton of sense. Makes a ton of sense. Um, as we're winding down on time, Jordan, love to pivot a little bit to just these questions I love to ask at the end. The first one is all around source of knowledge. So obviously, you know, what you're building, I'm sure the people you talk to, the people you interact with, a lot of this comes in one way or the other. But for everyone listening, and I think specifically, you know, with what you've done, I'd be curious if there's something you've, you've absorbed, whether it's a book, a podcast, just something from a source of knowledge that you're like, hey, if you're someone who's listening to this today and you hear this story and it gets you excited about your idea, something you would recommend? Yeah, it's a great question. I read a lot of news, a lot of news. Oh, okay. Don't hear that um, a lot. I do. And I actually don't read many books. I want to more. But I read a lot of news. So manufacturing dive and food dive, food business news. I am constantly reading new articles to try to make sure I'm staying in front of kind of everything that's happening. Uh, so I would say just generally news in the food what, and beverage world is kind of- Yeah, I was going to say, what, did you, what were the two you just said? Can you say those again? Yeah, manufacturer dive, kind okay. of like under the- I think Food Dive might be the, the broader brand. And then Food Business News are two, are two great ones. Nosh and BevNet, of course, are, are, are great ones that are more classics. But I'd find those other ones to be you know, a little bit more manufacturer-centric, which mm -hmm. is kind of where, where I kind of like to, to get my information. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, when you said news, my first, like, all of a sudden I was flashing, like, NBC, CNN. I'm like, huh. I'm like, I, I don't get that very <laughs> often. I'm like, what kind of news are you listening to yep. or reading? Okay, love that. You know, it's funny. Yeah, that's... I'm sure all those, are those all paid, like you to pay to see all those or that most totally, of them free? Totally no? free. Yeah. It's huh. great. Okay. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm about to add that to my repertoire. I don't read anything from those typically. Like Nosh and sure. BevNet, I'll see articles, but I get the paywall and I don't pay for it. So I have to- For BevNet and Nosh, there is a paywall. I, yeah. Maybe there is a paywall for food food dive. I honestly don't know exactly. It's probably but... worth it. I mean, that, that type of news is probably great for all it's of amazing. us. Yeah. But yeah, I- I need to get better about reading books. My girlfriend gives me shit all the time for not ever reading. It's it's Partly hard because I'm, I'm like sending emails or whatever. But I'm I, trying I to have read like, physical books more lately. Yeah, and it, I will tell you as and maybe I don't know, this is not not me trying to give you advice, but the having to put everything down electronically and just pick up a book and read it is kind of nice. Like it actually lets your brain just like focus on a book versus when I listen. I love audiobooks and podcasts, but at the same time, it's like I just have AirPods in and I'm doing things in the same realm for fucking 20 hours a day, it feels like. Um, on the subway to work, not to totally tangent again, but the subway to work, I opened a book for the first time in a while. Again, I'm, I'm making my sound, myself sound as if like I, I never read. It's more of like a physical like book in my hand type sure. of situation. Yeah, 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 That's yeah. not like yeah. a self-help, how can I get better at life type of book. Yeah. I was reading, buying an H Mart which is a classic in kind of the food and beverage world. I read three pages on the subway to work one day and I like felt so relaxed. Probably yeah, the best I have had yeah. in the last six months. And it was like, just because I think, because I just chilled out, didn't think about anything for a few minutes and then went on with my day. So isn't that, isn't that funny? You remember it too. Crazy. I, I've been reading this book. I, I'll send you a link to it. It's actually really good. It's called buy back your time. Great for you to read. Probably okay. it's all about just, I'll, I'll send you a little thing after this. It's, it's a, it's probably the, I've had two books in my life that were light bulbs in business, and this is the second one. So it's, it's interesting for sure. Okay. The last one, Jordan, this is my, this is my favorite question, um, especially with the software company. I'm excited to see what exactly you say here. What tools do you use to map out and plan big goals, whether that's you know, more than a year, your yearly goals, if you do that, all the way down to like, what's Jordan accomplishing this week? And, and ultimately, like, what's the shit you got to get done today? Are you a pen and paper guy? Are you an apps guy? I'm very excited to hear what you're, what you're responses to this knowing you have, you have a software company you've teed it up and i'm embarrassed to say this but i send myself emails for stuff to do <laughs> okay hey, it's well, so you bad. i mean it's honestly terrible because yeah it stresses me out that like i could miss something but like you know i probably send myself 15 to 20 emails a day which talk about like time suck just like random things Man. that i need to okay. do yeah, like I'll go on my like personal Gmail, send myself an email to my like keychain email, and like we'll go through things as a reminder of stuff that I need to do. Honestly, okay. I should just transition to a pen and paper such that I could just cross things out and kind of like take five minutes to start the day or five minutes to c conclude the day and like map out what I need to do the next day. But now, I mean, my schedule is so like one second I'm on a sales call, another one I'm in an ops meeting, another one I'm like talking to someone 
trying to recruit them. It's like a whole crazy mess of trying to jump from one thing to another that I kind of just have to trust that I'll remember it. Um, Yeah. Well, my process is sending myself emails and using that as my to-do list. Even though I'm embarrassed to say it. (laughs) No, no, no. It's funny. Most, again, I I say this too much. 99% of people I have on here are literally doing the simplest things. So I, I think there's something to be said about that. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate you taking the time to come on. Your story is super cool and you're, you're just getting started. So we should definitely do this in the future. I think I'm sure there's huge things to come. And like I said, this was organically one of my favorite podcasts I've gotten to do in a long time. So I'm excited to keep telling people about. Oh, I appreciate it. It was super fun. And thanks for having me, Shane. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Thanks for the time and uh, we'll stay in touch. Thanks.